Okay, we're, we're going to talk this morning about creating a servant leadership culture. And there's really two sort of aspects that I'm going to touch on in a very short period of time. One is that concept of servant leadership, and that's what we're going to spend most of our time on. But what I'm also going to do is talk a little bit about the concept of creating a culture. Because the reality is that the culture, whether it is intentional or unintentional, the culture is really and truly the identity of who you are. Let me give you an example. We did some work, we're, we're in Grapevine, we did some work with Grapevine. The city manager was concerned because in terms of culture and value system, he was concerned about how do we pass on the corporate DNA, our cultural DNA, and not lose that as we begin kind of combination continuing to grow rapidly and have a lot of senior managers that are reaching the age that we're going to start having more and more retirements. And the example he used with me that was so specific is that if I have somebody driving to work, if I have a pothole crew, that is going down the street and they're expected to accomplish X number of potholes during the day and they see a woman on the side of the road with a flat tire, he wants the priority to be to stop and assist that citizen. How do you train that in a world of objective performance evaluations and performance measures and all of those sorts of things and the underlying way you do that is through the creation of culture. Now, every one of your organizations have a culture. Some of those cultures are good, some of them are bad, and some of them are rotten. But every organization has a culture. And culture doesn't happen accidentally. Now, let me give you a couple of specific things. Number one, organizational theorists suggest that for an organization to walk the talk, of its culture, for it not just to be a bunch of signs and posters on the wall, the organization has to hear it every 28 days. How many of your organizations are imprinting culture every 28 days on your organization? Probably none of them. It's part of the reason that you end up with the situation where we've got a lot of HR people in the room, a department goes and fires somebody, and then they appeal, and they've had stellar performance reviews up until the point that somebody got so frustrated they fired them. That's a product of an organizational culture that does not effectively communicate performance expectations. You create a culture that avoids honest conversations. So culture plays out in so many different ways. So number one is that you've got to talk about it. There's a book out, I can't remember which book it is, but the, the message of the business book is that organizations become what they talk about. Whatever you're engaged in the conversation is what you really tend to begin to permeate. You begin to create culture. The second thing, and a lot of you in here have had people go through our supervisory series. We train about a thousand local government employees every month. We have about a thousand local government employees go through live training classes every month. The single class that has more students go through it than any other class is now that I'm a supervisor, for that first time supervisor. The number one comment or question, the number one question that comes out of that class, those attendees, is why doesn't somebody make my boss take this class because you're teaching me stuff we don't believe. Now, that is culture. One of the cultural dynamics of your organizations of local government, and it is one of the most clear clearly distinguish differences between government and the private sector. In the private sector, the higher you rise in the organization, 
the more your focus becomes strategic, not tactical, and by its very definition then, the more you've got to be looking out at where the future is, and the more you've got to be focused on learning. Warren Buffett was interviewed, there was a, a, a biography interview with him on CNN, it's been probably six months ago, and he was asked, what advice would you give to a young executive that wants to emulate you? And he said, I would tell them to read. I read one book a week. Now, if one of the five or six richest men in the world is constantly hungering to learn, we may have something to learn out of that. Now, what happens to us in local government is the higher we go in the organization, the more resistant to learning we tend to become. We tend to begin to view it as something that says, I have a weakness because I don't know everything. So therefore, I don't want to show my weakness because the sharks are circling in the water, right? So what happens, most of our training or orientation in an organization is focused on tactical stuff and we do very little imprinting of culture and we do very little creating a learning culture. It was not by accident that we called this conference creating a learning organization. I talked yesterday in the intro a little bit about the pace of change and yet what we're doing is we're still operating in a Tandy 800 world in many of our organizations. Does that make sense? So if we're going to shift culture, not only do we have to talk about it and we have to intentionally imprint it, but we've also got to truly walk the talk. And if senior management doesn't devote themselves to being learners, you will not create an organization that devotes itself to being a learning organization. An organization will reflect the values and operating style of senior leadership. Now you may have, you may have little, you know, you've got little renegade bands here and there that don't align, but in general, an organization will tend to reflect, it will tend to mirror the values of the senior leadership. So the core value that, that before everything else, what you've got to really begin to do is wrestle with how do we create a cultural value system that says we value being a learning organization. And, and there's a, you know, there's kind of, this is a, a, a personal kind of example or the, in a personal context, but it's a great example. And it simply is, how do you determine what an individual really, really values? You ask them what they spend their money on. Same thing is true with an organization. If you're not spending money on investing in your people, you don't value raising up great quality people. It's that simple. You can give it all the lip service in the world, but if you're not investing in it, you're not making it happen. Now, within that context, I'm going to share with you a little bit a value-based or a cultural-based leadership style and, and system that is about creating servant-based leadership. And I, and I actually, I believe strongly in servant leadership for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons I think it is so important is that in government, in local government, all of you, if you took and simply said, I'm going to go do the same thing that I do for the city, I'm going to go do it for a private corporation, there are more monetary rewards and less abuse and grief going over and doing it there than in local government. In other words, people are drawn into local government by and large because of an inner barometer that is a sense of calling that says, I want to make a difference. So what, what you got to do is begin to harness that in a positive way. Does that make sense? Is that logical? So what I believe is that servant leadership 
actually is the perfect leadership philosophy for local government because it really harnesses that underlying sense, that internal barometer that tended to draw most of your people into local government service. So we're going to talk a little bit about that here and, and go into a little more detail. Um, and I'm going to come back to this model. Most of you in here have seen this. This is our fourth dimension leadership model. I'm going to talk about it a little bit at the end and how this fits in. But I simply wanted to start by letting you know when, when your people go through any of our classes, the philosophy, that the, the red thread that goes through all of those classes that are being developed is a servant leadership philosophy. And we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between models and philosophy and, and things of that sort. Now let me give you a little bit of background on servant leadership. It was coined by a guy named Robert Greenleaf. He worked for AT&T uh, in management and development for about 40 years. Uh, and he made a lot of observations about great leaders. He went and studied great leaders and said, okay, what are the characteristics that I see in these people that I think are great leaders? That produced a book called The Servant Leader. And it gives you some indication of the power of his concepts that 1970 is almost 50 years ago and yet the concept of servant leadership still resonates with all of us. Now, there's a bazillion, I mean, there's a bazillion a month business books that are the flavor of the month. It's part of what draws me to servant leadership is that it's clearly not a flavor of the month. It has sustained for 50 years. Now, admittedly, in most organizations, it has more sustained in individual practitioners and believers rather than as part of an organizational culture. And I think part of what we've got to do is begin looking at how do we really create and imprint an organizational culture that begins to shape and mold the future of our organizations. And as a sidebar, we're going to be talking a little bit later about how to engage and how to develop next generation leaders. Uh, and then tomorrow we're going to be talking about generations, all the generational differences a little bit. The reality is this next generation coming in is an incredibly idealistic generation that wants to be engaged in something that makes a difference. They want to feel like what I am doing matters and makes a difference. Servant leadership harnesses those ideals in how you shape and mold your organization. So, so I think for a lot of reasons, the concepts of servant leadership make a ton of sense. Now, I want to talk for a moment. We'll come back to the, the, the nuts and bolts, but I want to talk to a moment. There's a difference between a leadership philosophy, a leadership style, and a leadership model. And, and we miss that lots of times. We, we really whoosh right past that and yet it is profoundly significant to understand those differences. So let's talk first. A leadership philosophy is your compass. It, it's what your philosophy is what gives you true north and lets you know here is our value system, here is what matters to us, here is what we hold dear, and it gives you that ability to evaluate and gauge true north. What it also does is shapes a way of thinking. Matt Mueller back here with City of Little Elm, City Manager in Little Elm. We were talking last night a little bit. Matt is taking and really rethinking the whole concept of performance evaluations. Because let's face it, after a hundred years of doing performance evaluations pretty much the same way, none of us really believe they work. Okay? I mean, we've been doing it for 50 years, for a hundred years, the same cotton-picking way None of us really passionately believe it works. We just keep doing it the same way because nobody's thought differently. Matt is doing some way cool thinking differently. And I'd encourage you, which means it's going to totally screw up your opportunity to get a cup of coffee and all that during the break. But I would encourage you to talk to Matt and, and hear some of the things he's talking about because it is way cool out there thinking. Matt is clearly a thought leader on this front. 
The next thing is that it is really rooted, and I kind of ref referenced this a minute ago, it's rooted in your values and beliefs. If your belief system is fundamentally, if your value system as a leader is autocratic and my way or the highway, you cannot create a servant leadership culture. See, that, that value system is in conflict and it is impossible to create a servant leadership culture if the value systems are not aligned. We're going to talk a little more about alignment in a moment. But, but remember that leadership philosophy is really rooted in that sense of values and beliefs. Okay, there are ten principles that Greenleaf articulated of servant leadership. We're still talking about leadership philosophy right now. There's ten principles that Greenleaf talked about and that, that really form the core or the foundation. We're going to talk about each one of those. They, these, as we go through them, they're in no, there's no significance to the order. All of them are equal, and all of them are necessary to really be an effective servant leader. The first is listening. Servant leader listens to others and is known by others who is, as someone who will give the time to really pay attention and listen. Ooh. Ooh. Hemingway said, when you listen, really listen. Most people never really listen. When I left Plano, I was assistant city manager, and they did a going away party for me. This will reference back to Mike's presentation yesterday. You'll see how strong of an RI I am. They did a going away party for me, and one of the things they did is they did a poster. When Ron says this, he means this. When Ron says okie dokie, he means you've had your five minutes, now get the blankety blank out of my office. Okay? See, what happens, I didn't think that was the message I was sending but it clearly was the message I was sending. See, sometimes our body language, our attention span, our shortness, whatever, will send messages that are different than the message we intend to send. And so one of those messages we often send is that we're not really interested in listening, even if in our heart of hearts we are, our behavior or our leadership style, and we're going to talk about style in a moment, sends a message that I'm not really interested in listening. Now, let me take that a step, a step further. Um, John Longstreet was mayor in Plano when I was there, and John was the general manager at the Harvey Hotel. John was the most phenomenal customer service guy I've ever met anywhere. Just amazing. One of the things John discovered in his hotel is that the best customer service feedback didn't come from his customer service reps or didn't go to his customer service reps, the counter people, anything of the sales people. The greatest customer feedback came to the maids and the, the uh, maintenance men and the janitors. But the people who were filling those positions didn't feel like anybody was interested in listening. Whole lots of all sorts of social issues, you know, all sorts of things can come into play, but the reality is they didn't feel like anybody was really interested in listening. So what John did, and I totally ripped this off and used it throughout my career, totally ripped John off, he instituted what he called what's stupid meetings. And the reason he implemented what's stupid meetings and called them what's stupid meetings was in an effort to give emotional permission to the people at the very, very front line who carried an emotional barrier as to whether anybody really wanted to listen. He looked for a dramatic way to send the message, I'm really serious about this, I really want to listen. Does that make sense? 
See, see, listening is not just about what our heart is, which is what we tend to do. We tend to go, oh, well, I value them. I'm willing to listen. But then our behavioral characteristics will, will sometimes create barriers or sometimes it is the self-imposed barriers of your people that don't think you're, even if you are, don't think you're interested in listening. So what you've got to do, if you really want to create a servant leadership culture, you've got to begin thinking about how do you create a culture that truly listens. And what you're going to find, just as John did, you're going to find that your greatest citizen feedback doesn't come from your mid-level managers, your elected officials, your city manager's office. Your greatest citizen feedback is going to come from the people out on the line. And so what you've got to do is begin thinking about if you really want to create a servant leadership culture, the first step is to begin figuring out how do we create a culture that really listens. The second one is empathy. Now, empathy, um, a, a servant leader realizes that each person is unique and has strengths and weaknesses and has genuine concern for others. Now, here's what's fascinating. Most of your organizations, I do a lot of city council retreats and a lot of management team retreats, and this will show up with them as well, but particularly with city council retreats. I would say 80%, 75% for sure, of every city council retreat I do will hone in as one of their core things they want to improve on is customer service. That, that, always is a, you know, that always comes up. We've got to get better at customer service. In the private sector, they tend to rely heavily on assessments that provide predictors of certain types of behavior. Customer service, there are tons of studies. Customer service consistently is delivered by people who, number one, have great listening skills, and number two, have authentic empathy for the other person. It's not, and the thing about it, those two characteristics are extraordinarily easy to evaluate in a validated assessment. That's real inexpensive. You can do them for probably 20 bucks. And yet, we're still doing business in a 1970s model that we're not using the tools we have available to hire people that actually addressed the number one itch that most of our elected officials have, and that is enhanced customer service. All of you have been there. See, we, we've become so process-oriented in local government, we're focused on did we give the right answer rather than did we manage the customer experience well. Let me give you an example of that. And we'll talk about this, a little, some of you heard me talk about this before, with our, our fourth dimension leadership because we think leadership matters at every level of the organization. Let me give you an example. If you have a utility billing clerk who comes in and they have an upset citizen because they think their bill is wrong and the utility billing clerk tells that citizen why the bill is correct, they have been technically proficient. They have done the job because we are process oriented. If you have equipped and trained and taught and held accountable that utility billing clerk to lead that citizen into understanding why their bill is correct, you get a totally different outcome. I guarantee you that we could go through today and there are, every one of you could immediately give 25 examples that you're frustrated with, your organization is frustrated with, where the city council has, you know, something's become a big issue with the council or the community or whatever, and you sit there and you go, but we did it right. They're beating us up and we did it right. We had the process correct. And I'm telling you, it's not about the process. You have to have the process right, 
But it's not about the process. It's about the experience. It's about managing the relationship that takes place. And so what happens is empathy is simply the sense that I, under, I feel your pain, so to speak. I understand where you're coming from. I can relate to you, and I can build a bridge with you, which then allows us to communicate. So your second key to building, to creating a servant leadership culture is begin valuing and training and encouraging empathy. And I would even say begin using tools in your selection process, particularly for customer service people, but it's probably true everywhere, people that have empathy for other people. Story broke. Somebody was telling me this yesterday. I don't remember where this was. It was not in this region. It was out, out somewhere. I can't remember. It was Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. Story broke. Now, you know, I'm always a little suspicious whatever shows up in the media, but a man has a heart attack. I don't know if it was a McDonald's or a park or whatever, is, is literally having a heart attack across the street from a fire station. Somebody, a bystander, runs across to the fire station, knocks on the door, the fireman comes to the door, and he tells him what's going on, and the fireman says, you need to call 911. Now, we've all seen some of those stories happen. Fortunately, they're pretty rare, but that is the antithesis of empathy. Does that make sense? That's, that's, a, that's a process, okay? That's a process mentality. That fireman had the process right, but they had the relationship wrong. And servant leadership at its base is about the relationship. Next, and this is going to sound a little strange, but it's healing. It is the most powerful principle as a part of servant leadership. And we really know in our heart that people have the ability to make others whole. And we also know that words either build up or tear down. Now, we are living in the most brutal political environment that I've seen, and I've been banging around city management since 1980. It is unreal what we're dealing with. Let me give you an example here in the Metroplex. Real story. A city not too far from here had two crews of two street guys that were painting, repainting water hydrants, fire hydrants. They're on two different streets. They're in the same neighborhood, but they're kind of working through their neighborhoods. Crew one finishes up their list about 20 minutes before lunch. Crew two is one street over, and they're not quite as far along. Crew one basically says, let's head over and help crew two finish up before lunch. Everything you want in the attitude of an employee. I mean, absolutely everything you want, going above and beyond, focused on the mission, focused on the job. So they head over to the next street over. They go pulling up in their truck. They get out of the truck and they say, hey guys, we're ahead of schedule. We got wrapped up. You want us to help you? Well, in the approximately five minute period that the four of them are standing there talking, the other crew is coming over to volunteer, a citizen goes by sees four city employees standing around a single fire hydrant, whips out his smartphone, snaps it, and sends it to Fox News. Fox 4 News takes and before the afternoon is out, calls the assistant city manager. The assistant city manager says, I I'm going to have city managers out. Let me try to find out, you know, let me check on what's really happened, all of that. Fox 4 News says, We've got a five o'clock deadline. I've got to have a quote. He says, it's going to take a little, this is about three o'clock in the afternoon. It's going to take a little bit of time. So Fox 4 News calls the mayor. And the mayor proceeds to rip up one side those gold bricking, lazy, good for nothing, tax wasting city employees. Now, how motivated do you think those employees are to go above and beyond again? 
nada. And we're operating in an environment in which, in a lot of cases, you don't want, you can't walk down the aisle of the grocery store without hearing people badmouthing anybody that works for the government, right? Let me give you one other example because some of you, I think you need to take this emotionally deep at heart. Won't, won't tell you which city it is, but I had a city manager call me. This was last summer, had actually last spring, had a city manager call me. He had a Hispanic employee who operated the phone, the, the reception desk and the phones and all of that. And she was spending every single day in tears because he had a council member who was posturing to run for state representative and who was doing lots of shouting about all of those worthless takers who were illegal immigrants and, you know, we need to make them all show their ID and all of this sort of stuff. And she was absorbing that and taking it personally. He tried to, the city manager had tried to talk to the council member and explain to him the impact to which the council member responded, she ought to be grown up enough to know I'm not talking about her, what he left off, but what was implied, I'm just talking about people who look like her, right? Now, understand what I'm telling you is that to create a servant leadership culture you've got to take a responsibility for creating a healing environment for your employees. Because the reality is somebody who is carrying incredible emotional distress is not going to be an optimal performer. The organization is going to pay a price for it short term and long term. And so one of the core, the ten core tenets that Greenleaf espouses is that we've got, to, we've got to take responsibility. If we want to create a servant leadership culture, we've got to take seriously the need and the opportunity to create a healing environment with our employees. Next is awareness. Now, this sense of awareness is what Greenleaf calls a disturber and an awakener. In other words, we tend sometimes to embrace willful ignorance of what's really going on. We tend to just, you know, that's not my fight, that's not my issue, and so what happens is employees begin in some cases to feel abandoned. They tend to feel like the system is not going to, to stand up. And so what you've got to do is recognize that to create a servant leadership organization, you've got to have a high degree of awareness of even the things that are a little bit disturbing that will tend to awaken the organization. And it's both about self-awareness and awareness of others. It's creating that culture that says, okay, something's not right with John. Something, this isn't normal. And let me give you an example of that. If you've got an employee who has been a great employee and all of a sudden they start making mistakes and performance goes south and all of these sorts of stuff and it is not consistent with the long-term pattern, our performance evaluation systems are designed to deal with the here and now. But the reality is if we're operating with a high degree of awareness we recognize something has happened that this is not about employee performance. It is about probably something going on in their lives which takes us back to the healing aspect. So what we've got to do is begin, we've got to really develop a much higher degree of awareness, both self-awareness, kind of go back to the listening conversation, as well as awareness of others. And then what we've got to do as well is when we become aware that something needs to be done, we've got to work towards correcting what's wrong. Number one barrier to creating a culture, whatever that culture is, an, an intentional culture, number one barrier is that the organization doesn't believe that leadership walks the talk. In other words, not only do you fail to create a servant leadership culture, 
if you have a, a value system that says ABC and then you don't live up to ABC, not only do you fail to move the ball forward, you actually move it backwards because your credibility gets shot. In other words, if you know there's something wrong going on and everybody knows you know that there's something wrong going on that needs to be corrected, but you ignore it, then what happens, it's not just that, that it's not about that issue, it's that you destroy your credibility in the organization about how you do business. I'll give you a real world example of that. Um, a few, a number of years ago, getting an increasing number of years ago, when I was city manager in Garland, my brother was driving through Garland and got a ticket. And he tried to play the, my brother's the city manager card. <laughs> well, not only did the police officer say, I know your brother and I know what he preaches and I think he would not want me to do this. When I found out about it, I wrote a commendation for the police officer because I wanted to send the message, this isn't a dual standard. If, if anything, it's just the opposite. And this is what I preach to city councils a lot. When you, the higher you go, the less freedom you have. The higher you go, the more responsibility you have to walk the talk. Because make no mistake, your people are watching what you're doing. And do as I say, not as I do, doesn't work with employees any better than it works with children. So what we've got to do is we've really got to have this high degree of awareness. The next is persuasion. And, and what we mean by that is you go in and you use persuasion to inspire trust and to motivate people and to get them to, to want to follow you, want to charge the hill. Because the reality is if you've got to use coercion, then as soon as the gun is moved away from their head, they're not going to stay on task. They're not going to stay on mission. What you want to do is learn to use the skill set of persuasion so that you're able to inspire people and cause people to have trust that says, that's where I'm going, that's where we're headed, I'm on board, I know the mission, I know the vision, I know the direction. Next is foresight. This really kind of goes back in some respects to what I was saying a few minutes ago about becoming a learning organization. Servant leaders are intuitive. But the reality is you can't be intuitive if you're not in a constant learning mode. Intuition is based on a foundation of understanding, more on a basis of understanding than of knowledge. One of the things, one of, one of, my, one of my mentors early on, Bob Woodruff, when I first went to work in Plano, Bob Woodruff, who was city manager, and Bob taught me when your gut and the data are in conflict, trust your gut. Now, you can't trust your gut if you don't have understanding. But there's a difference in having knowledge and having understanding. Does that make sense? So what you've got to do is begin to create organizations that value understanding more than knowledge. Let me give you an example of where we go astray with this. One of the biggest mistakes that city management teams make is that they think council agenda items are, they conclude when you get four hands in the air, or three or six or however many people you've got on your council. In other words, they think the agenda process is about getting to the vote and that's where it ends. In reality, the agenda process is about, it, the, end of, the agenda process does not end until that elected official goes out into the community and defends and articulates and explains 
why they voted the way they voted. So what happens is we tend to be biased towards loading councils up with lots of knowledge with our agenda packets, lots of facts and figures, and just you know, crushing them under the weight of data, but we don't tend to equip them to go out and articulate why they did what they did in a bumper sticker world. See, we're in a world that wants to communicate at a bumper sticker level of complexity, and so we've got to begin, if we really want to create a servant leadership culture, We've got to move away from just simply stacking, not stacking data or knowledge up, and we've really got to start having intuitive understanding about the context of what's going on, where the trends are, and what's happened, you know, what, what has colored this issue in the past, the present, and the future. Now, when we start talking about the future, we talked yesterday a little bit about the unbelievable pace of change that we're dealing with. When we start talking about the future in that kind of an environment, you can not be an intuitive leader if you are not a learning leader. If you are not constantly learning Go back to the Warren Buffett example. If you are not constantly learning, you cannot be intuitive because the pace of change is so unbelievable and the stuff that's changing is so dynamic, we can't possibly keep up. Let me give you an example of that. Um, a book uh, called The Extreme Future. Now, the guy who wrote The Extreme Future was a, uh, he, he was a consultant to the second Bush White House. Uh, he, I mean, so he's not a flake, he's not out on the edge. Let me tell you one of the things that he says with that. Um, uh, one of the things he says is that we have already begun teleporting stuff. You know what teleporting is? Beam me up, Scotty. Now, what he says is we've teleported small items very short distances, thank you. We've, we've teleported small items very short distances. But where he says we are headed is that we will be producing, we will be manufacturing television sets in Japan and teleporting them to the dock in San Francisco for distribution. Now, I got to tell you, I have a hard time buying that. I have a hard time believing that is anything other, anything short of just absurd. Almost as absurd as my dad thought it was in the mid-90s when they said, or mid-80s, when they said, we have invented a new machine that you can sign your name on a piece of paper here, feed it into your phone line, and it'll pop out on the other side of the globe in your signature. See, what's happening is we, our organizations, are losing the ability to be intuitive because we are losing the ability or losing the willingness to be learning organizations. And you cannot be intuitive if you are not tuned in to the changes that are happening in the world all around us. You've you basically need to be able to identify current trends and then make wise decisions based on those trends. And there's an incredible number of trends that are just, that are overwhelming, that are changing, and then we talked about that yesterday. The next one is stewardship. It understands, this is probably the one that, that in local government we intuitively understand better than any of the other principles. It, it, the servant leader understands we've been entrusted with stuff that isn't ours. We've been entrusted with something that, that raises a higher duty than if we owned it to be able to make sure it's well managed. And there is this sense of wants to leave a legacy. Now, I will tell you, this is one of the greatest challenges right now in the current political culture because... If you flash back 10 years ago, 20 years ago for sure, 
the political culture tended to be more civic oriented. It tended to be more focused on what's for the good of the... They may disagree on what their vision for what was good was, but it tended to be long-term focused for the long-term good of the entire community. We now are in an environment in which we are increasingly focused just on playing political gamesmanship and one-upsmanship for the next election cycle. We have dramatically shortened our time horizon. It's one of the reasons most of you in here, if you don't get the 10 and 10 on leadership and innovation, let us know out front and we'll add you to it. Most of you in here get it. It's one of the reasons we started producing a companion newsletter that we call Legacy Leadership that is designed specifically for elected officials because we're trying to begin Go back to what I said a few minutes ago, an organization becomes what it talks about. We're trying to begin engaging an increasing number of elected officials just in thinking about leaving a legacy. Because if they will change, it doesn't matter what the issue is, if you or the elected officials in any context will change the horizon for the decision you're wrestling with away from a short term to a next generation horizon, you will totally transform your decision making process, you will transform the politics, and you will change what the outcome of the decision is. Because stuff that looks brilliant for next May looks unbelievably stupid for the next generation. And so what we've got to do is we've got to learn how to value long-term stewardship. That's my modification of Greenleaf stuff. We've got to begin changing the conversation so that people understand that stewardship in its essence is not just about this month's tax rate. It's really about what is the impact of this decision on the next generation. And then conceptualization. Servant leaders nurture the ability to be visionary in themselves and others. Servant leaders have both short-term and long-term clarity. Servant leaders keep calm in the face of struggles because of their vision. Let me back up. Whoop. I told you all I was a dinosaur yesterday with technology. Part of conceptualization is all about moving into a strategic visioning process so that you're you're beginning to really work a long-term plan. We do, as I mentioned, we do a lot of city council retreats and we've tried to move the conversation away from talking about strategic planning and towards strategic visioning. It's driven by this concept of concept conceptualization. You've got to be able to paint the picture of where you're going and why it's worth sacrificing to be able to get there. And then building community. It inspires others to work together towards a co common goal builds teams within organizations, and then a commitment to the growth of the people. We started out talking a little bit about learning organizations. We've got to be able to commit to growing our people. We've got to recognize that in the kind of rapidly changing world we're in, we are doing a disservice to our team. We are doing a disservice to our employees if we are not investing in their growth and development. And then we've got to recognize, whoops, others, we ought to, well, it, it kind of, others ought to be better off by the fact that they know them. In other words, if we're really talking about the growth of our people, then what happens is that people are better off because they interact with you. They're better off because they know you, and the same thing with your whole organization. And this is, this is one of the most practical things you could do to become a learning organization, is go home today and change your evaluation systems it begins to hold supervisors accountable for the growth of the people that report to them. Most of your performance evaluation systems do not even recognize the role of the manager or the supervisor in developing their people. And yet, if you want to create that culture, that's a very key core thing. Now, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to move very quickly here. Leadership style as contrasted with philosophy. Servant leadership is the philosophy. Leadership style 
describes the leader's behaviors. They are influenced by the leader's personality. They're influenced by the goals of the leader. They're influenced by the leader's relationship to the followers. And there's really two types of leadership style. One is transactional, which historically has predominated in local government, where the leader causes a follower to act in a certain way in return for something the follower wants to have or avoid, i.e. more pay for more productivity, going back to Matt's kind of vision of what the future ought to look like. That's a transactional style. If you show up for work on time every day, you get a two, which translates into a 2% pay increase. By contrast, a transformational style, the leader taps into the follower's higher needs and values and inspires them with new possibilities. The leader raises their level of confidence, conviction, and desire to achieve a common purpose. In other words, it's addressing this emotional need. It's addressing the internal barometer, the internal compass that says, I want to make a difference. I'm a part of something that matters. Therefore, I'm willing to sacrifice to be a part of that mission. Now, by contrast, so, so you've got leadership philosophy, leadership style, and now leadership model provides a process or framework or template for applying the leadership to given situations. And one model that we really like, and we, we use a lot of Kuzas and Posner stuff, in their book, The Exemplary Leader, they map out one particular leadership model. It's called Model the Way, or I mean the steps are Model the Way, Inspire a Shared Vision, Challenge the Process, Empower Others to Act, and Encourage the Heart. So that's the model of how they take and, and develop those, or, uh, how, how you lead. Now, we're not going to get into it today, partially because of time and partially because a lot of you have seen bits and pieces of it before, but the real question then becomes how do you create an aligned system to, to a strategy for really creating that alignment? And what we've done is everything, most of you in here, a lot of your people were training, servant leadership is the underlying philosophy of everything we do. Servant leadership is the red thread that flows through everything. The exemplary leader is the model. You'll hear us constantly talking about these aspects, although they're not usually this, this uh, packaged, but it, it winds through everything we do. And transformational is the style. In other words, how do you inspire people to buy into the vision, to want to accomplish the mission, instead of just simply saying, being task or, or tactical oriented, that you do what I told you to do? And as you know, you've seen the fourth dimension leadership model. I mentioned a moment ago, we think it is all about leadership. At every level of the organization, we think it's really and truly about leadership. It simply is taking and contextualizing it appropriately for that particular level of the organization. We believe it's the foundation is relational, which has two aspects, customer service and human relations. Let me give you a quick example. Uh, distinction, human relations, uh, sexual harassment, for example, the traditional way that most organizations teach ha sexual harassment stuff is here's where the lines are. The very process of teaching where the line is motivates some employees to go up to the line. By contrast, if you're teaching sexual harassment prevention through a relational leadership model, it is about what am I doing that is honoring and enhancing and creating a healthy mutual relationship, which means the, where the line is, you still got to have the rules, but where the line is is irrelevant because the motivation is different. Does that make sense? Um, then the next level up is operational. Uh, you've got two aspects of that. One is supervisory leadership. One is managerial. Uh, at the relational leader level, people follow you predominantly because of how you treat them. At the relational level, people follow because how you treat them. At the operational level, they follow you because you know more than they do. It is positional authority and intellectual authority. In other words, you know more than they do, therefore they follow. The next level up is the systems leadership level. Two aspects there, one is trust building, one is systems building. With that level, what you're really trying to do is you're shifting away from the leadership being individualized. So in other words, if you feel like you've been mistreated and it's all dependent upon me, 
then you're not going to have great confidence. But if you think the system has integrity, it doesn't matter how I mistreat you because you have confidence that the system is going to straighten it out. So at the systems leadership level, you're trying to build systems that have integrity that the organization has confidence in. And then at the strategic level, everything below the strategic level is really focused on how do you get better at what you do. At the, system, at the strategic level, it's about how do you become what you want to become as an organization. So it is that shift from internal to external. Now, we could go into a lot more detail. We really don't have the time. But, but I wanted to give you that sense. I am, I am so sold. I am so convinced, so convicted that servant leadership is the way that we need to be moving our organizations. I'm convinced that culture, that philosophy is the thing that will more than anything else begin to transform the organizations. But we've got to go about it in a thoughtful, holistic, we've got to work a game plan. You can't simply suddenly post some posters and all of a sudden everybody becomes servant leaders. You've got to work a very meticulous plan and it is a three to five year process to transform the, organ, uh, the culture of an organization. It is hard work, but it is truly transformational. Uh, thank you all so much for letting me start stuff off this way this morning. Uh, we're going to have a, uh, about a 15 minute or actually about a 11 minute break since I've run over and get us back on schedule. So if you'd be back in here in about 11 minutes, we'd appreciate it. Thank you all very much.